Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. Today, we are finishing the 1920s, uh, and you know, what better part to finish on a high note uh, than talking about the Harlem mm -hmm. Renaissance. So without further ado, let's let's get into it. <clears throat> All right. The Harlem Renaissance, Module 8, Lesson 6. And yes, we finished Module 8. Finally. Taking forever. <laughs> that was your warm-up. Uh, objectives. Students will be able to discuss the pull factors that prompted many African Americans to move to northern cities, critique the ways African Americans pro leaders proposed to combat discrimination and violence, and assess the way the, uh, the impact African American forms and musicians had on popularizing Black culture. So, just so you know, and I've said it before, uh, I abbreviate African American to AFAM. Um, so instead of writing it out all the time, okay, that's part of that shorthand I told you guys to figure out at the beginning of the year. That's my shorthand. All right, black is beautiful. So after World War I, Jim Crow laws continued to make life hard for African Americans living in the South. Many African Americans looked north for more security, freedom, and opportunities. Their migration to cities was an expression of their changing attitude to themselves, an attitude perhaps best captured in a phrase first used around this time, black is beautiful. So between 1910 and 1920, a movement known as the Great Migration took place. We've talked about this ad nauseum. Hundreds of thousands of African Americans uprooted themselves from their homes in the South and moved to the North in big cities in search of jobs. That is the Great Migration. And by the end of the decade, 5.2 million of the nation's 12 million African Americans lived in cities, and that's 40% of the population. However, northern cities in general had not welcomed the massive influx of African Americans. Tensions escalated in the years prior to 1920. In the summer of 1919, these tensions culminated in approximately 25 urban race riots. In addition, the concentration of African Americans in big cities would eventually lead to legal discrimination in mortgage lending practices. So, shame on you, mortgage lenders. And you know, it, it it's kind of ironic that well, not this just shows you how racist our past was. Yes, the North, if you think about it, all, all the way back to the Civil War, the North was against slavery and. It's ironic that these new um, migrants, they're not immigrants, new migrants from the South to the North, being African-American, taking over industry, war industries jobs um, while others went off to fight for in World War I, it, it, you would think they would be more tolerant of African-Americans, and that clearly was not the case. So again, here's the big, uh, the Great Migration. More than 100,000, um, if you look at the bubbles, uh, more than 100,000 African Americans went to Chicago, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York. And you got 50 to 100,000, or New Orleans, they stay, they kind of stay the same. Um, and yeah, see, look at all these people. Going north, going north, go north. Uh, and here's a newspaper clippings picture of, especially in Chicago, there are a lot of a lot of riots. All right, hashtag goals. So the prosperity of the twenties did not benefit all American equality. African Americans remained the targets of discrimination. Several new organizations, however, sought to improve the lives of African Americans. One such group was the National Urban League, which tried to remove barriers to black employment. And found in 1909, test question, the National Association for the Advancement of Color Peoples, NAACP, 
urged African Americans to protest racial violence. W. E. B. Du Bois, one of the founding members, led a parade of 10,000 African Americans to protest such violence in New York City. The event was called the Silent Parade or the Silent Movement. However, it did not convince President Woodrow Wilson to improve protections for African Americans. Du Bois would use the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, as a platform for leading a struggle for civil rights. And under the leadership of James Weldon Johnson, JWJ, the organization fought for the legislation to protect African American rights. It made anti lynching laws one of its main priorities. And three anti lynching laws would be brought forth, but none were passed. The NAACP continued its campaign through anti-lynching organizations that had been established since 1892 by Ida B. Wells. And gradually, over time, lynchings dropped, and the NAACP now represented the new, more militant voice for African Americans. So that's the National Urban League with the equal sign. That's W.E.B. Du Bois. Not, not Du Bois, Du Bois. All right, and here's James Weldon Johnson, and there's Stop Lynching Protests. All right, back to Africa. So although many African-Americans found their voice in the NAACP, they still face the daily threats of discrim uh, and discrimination. Marcus Garvey, an immigrant from Jamaica, believed that African-Americans should, should build a separate society. His different, more radical message of black pride aroused the hopes of many. And in 1914, Garvey founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA. And in 1918, the UNIA moved to New York City and opened offices to urban ghettos in order to recruit followers. Garvey also lured followers with practical plans like his, like his program to promote African-American businesses he will also encourage his followers to return to Africa, a scheme sometimes called the Back to Africa movement. And theoretically, when they had arrived back in Africa, the new arrivals were to throw off the white colonial oppressors and build a mighty nation. These goals formed the basis of what is now called black nationalism, the idea that all black people are one and they, they should put aside their differences to unite. Despite the appeal of Garvey's movement, support for it declined by the mid-20s. At the time, he would be convicted of mail fraud and he would be jailed. So although his movement dwindled, Garvey left behind a powerful legacy of newly awakened Black pride, economic independence, and a reverence for Africa. So this whole slide will be a test question, probably a short answer one. You know I love short answer questions. So that's Marcus Garvey. And that's his plan to take former um, oppressed people, African-Americans, and take them back to Africa. And that's the black nationalism uh, logo. All right, the black capital of America. Many African-Americans who migrated north moved to Harlem, a neighborhood in the Upper West Side of New York's Manhattan Island. In the 1920s, it became the world's largest black urban community. Like many other neighborhoods, Harlem suffered from overcrowding, unemployment, and poverty, but its problems would be eclipsed by a flowering of creativity called the Harlem Renaissance, a literary and artistic movement celebrating African-American culture. And above all, HR, Harlem Renaissance, was a literary movement led by well-educated middle-class African-Americans who expressed a new pride in the African-American experience. They celebrated their heritage, and wrote with defiance and poignancy about the trials of being black in a white world. Claude McKay's poetic verses urged African Americans to resist, resist prejudice and discrimination. Langston Hughes, test question, is the best known poet of the movement. His 1920s poems describe the difficult lives of working class African Americans. He will gain worldwide recognition for his work, and his poems influence generations of many more African American writers. Zora Neale Hurston's works portrayed the lives of poor, unschooled Blacks. Her works celebrated the common person's art form, the simple folk ways and values of people who had survived slavery through their ingenuity and strength. So this is Harlem, a picture in the 1920s. 
That's Langston Hughes on the left, and that's Zora Neale Hurston on the right. Performances. So the spirit and talent of the HR, again, Harlem Renaissance, reached far beyond the world of writers and intellectuals. Some observers, such as Langston Hughes, noted that the movement was launched by with the uh, black musical comedy Shuffle Along in 1921. And during the 1920s, African Americans in the performing arts won large followings. Roland Hayes rose to stardom as a concert singer. Actress and singer Ethel Waters debuted on Broadway in the musical Africana. Paul Robeson, son of a one-time slave, became a major dramatic actor. His performance in Shakespeare's Othello, first in London and then in New York City, was widely acclaimed. He also struggled with the racism he experienced in the U.S. and the indignities spoken to him because of his support for the Soviet Union and the Communist Party. So that's Roland Hayes, that's Ethel Waters, and that's Paul Robeson. Or from left to right, Roland Hayes, Ethel Waters, and Paul Robeson. All right, jazz, baby. So jazz was born in the early 20th century in New Orleans. The musicians blended instrumental, instrumental ragtime and vocal blues into an exuberant new sound. In 1918, Joe King Oliver and his Creole jazz band traveled north to Chicago carrying jazz with them. And in 1922, a young Louis Armstrong would join Oliver's group. Armstrong's talent rocketed him to stardom in the jazz world. Famous for his astounding sense of rhythm and his ability to improvise, Armstrong made personal expression a key part of jazz. After two years in Chicago, he joined Fletcher Henderson's band in 1924 and at the time, it was New York City's most important jazz band. Armstrong would become the most important and influential musician in the history of jazz. Test question if I've ever heard one before. Jazz quickly spread to such cities like Kansas City, Memphis, and New York City. It was the most popular music for dancing, and its new musical style became so fashionable that the 1920s are called the Jazz Age. Harlem pulsed the sounds of jazz, which lured throngs large groups, throngs of whites to the showy exotic nightclubs, included the famed, including the famed Cotton Club. And that's his, uh, the Creole jazz band. And I believe this is Louis Armstrong right here. Cause that's him and his trumpet. All right, the Duke. So in the late twenties, Edward Kennedy, Duke Ellington, jazz pianist and composer, led his 10-piece his ten piece orchestra at the Cotton Club. In the 20s and 30s, Ellington won renown as America's greatest composers. Cab Cop Calloway, drummer, saxophonist, and singer, formed another important jazz orchestra playing at Harlem's Savoy Ballroom and at the Cotton Club, alternating with Duke Ellington's band at the same time. Calloway, along with Armstrong, will popularize the scat um, method or improvised jazz singing using sounds instead of words. Bessie Smith, a female blues singer, was probably the most outstanding vocalist of the decade. She recorded on black-oriented labels produced by the major record companies. She achieved enormous popularity in 1927, became the highest-paid black artist in the world. Many of jazz of the jazz tunes that were published as sheet music by companies on New York City's West, West 28th Street was nicknamed Tin Pan Alley for the sound of conflicting tunes blasting from the streets businesses. Kind of like my classroom. That's the Duke. That's Cab Calloway. And that is oh, what's her name? Bessie Smith. That's Bessie Smith. All right, more contributions. So painters and other artists also contributed their talents to the Harlem Renaissance. Sculptor Richmond Barthay, Barthe. many of his works include a monument to Haitian hero Toussaint L'Elvature and a portrait of the statue of Booker T. Washington. Aaron Douglas painted murals and illustrated books and magazines. Many of Palmer Hayden's paintings were inspired by African-American folklore. James Van Der Zee used innovative techniques for his photographs of middle-class Black New Yorkers. And these are just a few, as many more prominent artists, artists could be named here as well. For, again, pop, this is all popularizing Black culture, African-American culture in America. These are just a few of the people. 
All right, dub culture. So the Harlem Renaissance put African Americans on the country's cultural stage with their increased numbers in big cities and their significant contributions to the art. African Americans were inspired to take new pride in their achievements and importance. In addition, the Harlem Renaissance represented a portion of the great social and cultural changes sweeping the country in the 1920s. This period was characterized by economic prosperity, new ideas, changing values, and personal freedom, as well as the important developments in the arts. Most of these social changes were long-lasting. However, the economic boom would be short-lived. And that's... I think this is a thumbnail to a video, but I typed in Harlem Renaissance and this is what I got. It's pretty cool. All right. So that concludes Module 8. That concludes the Harlem Renaissance and... Hopefully you learned something new. Um, it's so important it gets its own section. So um, good job on the book, dub book. Uh, anyways, your homework is page 407, three through five, 407, three through five. All right. If you guys did enjoy that, make sure you hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.